Well, hi everyone. Today I'm gonna to be looking at a video uh, that brings up a uh, age old question about the Christian faith, um, having to do with hell and God's goodness and God's knowledge. So let's take a look at it and I'll give some comments afterwards. I have a question for Christians that believe in hell and also believe in an all knowing, all loving, all powerful God. So that should be all Christians, just by the way. Jeremiah 1.5 says that before you were in your mother's womb, before you formed, I knew you. So before God forms this human in its mother's womb, does God know if that human is going to go to hell or going to go to heaven? If God doesn't know, then God is not all-knowing. And if that God does know and chooses to create that human anyways, he is intentionally creating humans that will suffer for all of eternity. And that individual does not actually have free will because that God knew ahead of time when he was creating them that they would end up going to hell. And that person did not have a choice in that matter because it was already decided as soon as God formed them in their mother's womb. You cannot have an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God and hell. So this question that she brings up, I mean, it's, it is not a new question. Um, so in some way, if you've been around the block a little bit as a believer, this is not breaking news that, that there's sort of this question about, um, just in general, it doesn't always have to do with hell in, in the way that it's formed, but about suffering in the world and about evil in the world. And, you know, people will talk about the whole idea of, you know, if God is all knowing and if God is all loving, or, or sometimes it's not even all knowing, but if God is all powerful and God is all loving, then how can there be suffering and, and sadness in the world. And so she, she's forming it uh, mainly along those same lines, but with a slight difference. One of the interesting things that she got into there was um, because she was focusing on God being all-knowing, she said that if God knew what the person who he formed was going to do later, then that person didn't have free will. Um, that's actually not right. Um, God could, and, and there's different people that have different takes on sort of um, God's knowing versus God's determining that that'll come into play later on. But it's not actually true that if God knew, then that meant that they didn't have a choice. It would just mean that God knew the choice that they were going to make. Um, but, but to her point, it, it does, it, her point is fair just in the sense that broadly speaking, and again, Christians differ on the exact way that this all works. We believe in an all-powerful God. So if you're adding all-powerful in there, you could say, well, God could certainly do something about this. And then if you get into the question of predestination and election and things like that, you'd say, well, if God is choosing people, then that that does bring up the question of whole, you know, how much free will do people have? So the broad question here is a fair one, but I also would say it's not a new one. And so I think as a Christian, even if you don't feel sort of settled on this question, this gal has not suddenly discovered something that we've never thought about. Um, the amount of books that have been written, articles that have been written, you know, all, all kinds of things that you can find on YouTube, all kinds of things that have been, been wrestled through, all kinds of sermons that have been preached. This is not a new subject. Christians do not hide from this subject. So I say that just to say that this is not some new idea. This is something that we've talked about and wrestled through for a long time. If you look at the authors of the Bible, there's wrestling through this and all kinds, I mean, the book of Job is a wrestling match through this. The book of Habakkuk, the, the, the um, author of that is wrestling through the whole question of how do I, how do I trust in God's goodness even though there's these things going on and I don't like what God is doing or it's confusing and there's evil and why doesn't he stop this? So this is not a new question. So we can at least take a breath and say there have been Christians for thousands of years who have not felt like this is a deal breaker even though they've acknowledged that this question is a challenge of, of hell and of suffering in general. Um, what, what I would say is this, when we get into the realm where we're dealing with the question of free will, it, it's not that I think that there's nothing we can understand about it, but this is an area where nobody really understands what's going on. Um, no worldview, secular or religious, really knows how to understand the whole dynamic of free will, because we all know that to some degree it's limited, that even if you don't believe in God, that it, it to some degree is limited by our circumstances and by our biology and by our upbringing and by our culture. So, so to some degree it's limited, 
but at least it appears to us that to some degree it's also there, that we see people in similar situations with similar upbringing and maybe even similar genes, maybe even twins that share DNA, uh, make different choices, that, that those elements don't utterly determine their lives. So we seem to live just in the practical reality of saying, all right, we understand that we're not utterly free because we have other things that influence the way that we live. And at the same time, we think people do have real meaningful choices and that they're responsible for their choices. What I would say is that is the world as the Bible presents it to us. That's the world as we experience it. And that is the world that's presented to us through scripture that there's this tension that we experience where God is all powerful and God has a plan and he's working out his plan and no one can thwart that plan. And even when we get into sort of human response that nobody can come to Jesus unless the father draws him and that the talk about election, God choosing us before we came to him, he regenerated our hearts. And at the same time, there's nothing in the Bible that ever gets away from the idea that we are absolutely responsible for our actions. In fact, in, in Romans kind of 9 and 10, as Paul's talking about some of these subjects, he, he anticipates the question. He, he anticipates an objection that, all right, if, if God chooses to harden certain people and draw certain people, then why does he blame us? Or why does he hold anyone accountable? And Paul's response to that is to say, who are you to talk back to God? And that may be a response that in our instincts we don't really like. We're like, well, we'll just answer the question. But what I think Paul is getting at here is these are profound, deep questions. We, we don't understand this. This seems to be beyond our capacity. Um, but for us to speak back to God in a way that somehow gets in his face and tells him that we have a problem with what he's doing in this is not appropriate because he is God. He knows all things. And we as believers in Jesus have had enough evidence from him that we trust not only his wisdom, but also his heart towards us. He who did not withhold his one and only son, but gave him up for us, how will he not along with him freely give us all things? So when it comes to how we wrestle through this question, I don't think any of us is going to get a complete answer to say, all right, this is, I, I now understand completely the mechanism of God's sovereignty and God's knowledge and our free choice and exactly how these work together and exactly how much free choice I have and exactly how much God determines, uh, all of those things. I, I think that it's a fool's errand to try to get complete clarity on that subject. I think we can say this is the world as God has presented it to us. This is also the world as we experience it. it. It happens to line up pretty well between the two and that we've seen enough about God that on a question that we're not gonna get complete clarity and we're gonna deal with some intellectual and also some just emotional angst over it that we're willing still to trust God moving forward. Um, that's not checking your brain at the door. That's not shutting your eyes or ignoring a question. That's sort of living in reality and living in the tension of reality. And believers in Jesus have been doing this for a long time. For a long time, we felt like there are enough reasons to continue to trust God, even though we live with some tension of not understanding how certain dynamics work together.